Hello and welcome. I am Steve Clements, editor at large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us for our great program today, The Future of Cities, a discussion with mayors from all over the country. We're holding this forum on the sidelines of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Winter Meeting, which is happening right now, just across the street from our studio here in Washington, D.C. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the American Public Transportation Association and Tableau for their support of today's discussions. U.S. cities are really diverse, they're dynamic, they're constantly evolving, but nearly two years ago, the COVID-19 pandemic arrived and sped up this evolution big time. Since then, it's pressure tested our infrastructure, our economy, and our collective strength. But with added challenges come increased opportunities to reshape our existing structures and build more sustainable cityscapes and enhance economic stability and resilience and improve the lives of re residents, especially those who are most vulnerable. With the passage of the infrastructure bill, what comes next for America's cities? How can city leaders work with communities to strengthen connections across cultures and across generations? And finally, as we envision in the city of tomorrow. What pitfalls should we sidestep? What blind spots do we have? What new heights should we expect to climb? We're going to be speaking to some of the most influential and interesting mayors from across the country today. But first, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at at the Hill events using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Cities. We're broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the program. And it's with any live stream. If you experience any trouble, don't throw your computer out the window. Just refresh the page. They tell me that will fix it. I'm not going to laugh here, but I hope it works for you. We kick things off today with two Conference of Mayor's Leaders. Hillary Sheevy of Reno, Nevada, one of my favorite cities, is the second mm -hmm. Vice President of the Conference of Mayors. And Brian Barnett, a friend, I've talked with him before, he's been a great friend of the Hill. Brian is a mayor of Rochester Hills, Michigan. He's the former president, I, I should actually say, he's the immediate past president of the conference. Innovation and inclusion are two top priorities for both mayors. Mayor Sheevy and Mayor Barnett, great to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Let me just ask you, I, I think, uh, uh, a gauzy question, which is, you know, in Washington, D.C., you look around the country, and our narrative here is a divided nation, not just two sides, maybe seven sides, you know, a toxic culture, communities not engaging, people living in bubbles. You know, mayors have this responsibility to kind of sew things together and get people to, to, to work in more pragmatic ways. So, Mayor Shivi, when you kind of, you know, looking at the future of sewing your community together and meeting needs, what's at the hot the top of your priority list? Well, you're right. Mayors are very, very nonpartisan, and we live and work right in our communities, right, every single day. You know, I think now more than ever, this pandemic has taught us resiliency, but also really looking at cities in different ways and how we can bring our communities together. I mean, I think unity now more than ever is, is what my community is really craving. And I think there are so many ways that we get this opportunity in looking at futures of our city and not just today, but what is the future? And so uh, this infrastructure bill is going to be critical on how we build our cities into the future. And I think, you know, honestly, unity is a huge, huge proponent of that because we felt so isolated for the last couple of years, certainly due to this pandemic. So mayors are really looking at innovative ways with this infrastructure bill and how we can unify our communities. I think mayors were already um, sort of the cheerleaders of, of that initiative. But now more than ever, we really know what we need to see in our cities to really unify. Well, tell us a little bit more about that. You know, Reno, Nevada is one of the places, I mean, I, just to be honest, I ended up there more often than not in that city on New Year's Eve than any other city. So, so but if I were not just there on New Year's Eve and, and we were kind of looking at transportation, you've got this cool thing I've been reading about the Neon Line District. You know, get, you know put some uh, bells and whistles on what that transportation infrastructure is going to look like down the road. What, what um, opportunities do you see? What problems are you solving for your, for your citizens? Well, now more than ever, I mean, transportation is changing. A lot of people, you know, think immediately cars and things of that nature. I think obviously in this pandemic, we're looking at public health, certainly broadband, that is really important. One of the things about Reno, I think people think Reno has been predominantly gaming. We have really diversified our economy. That was really important to me. I'll, I'll tell you a quick little story. You might like this, but growing up here, people would say, where are you from? And I would say Lake Tahoe. I was sort of embarrassed to be from Reno and I really wanted to build a city that was inclusive and other people and people like me that grew up and were born and raised here that wanted to be a part of. So we've really diversified our economy. We have companies like 
Apple, Amazon, uh, Apple, Switch, all building and investing here. But I've also invested a lot in arts and culture and micro mobility. Now more than ever, we'll see you know technology change and evolve. And so um, you know, Reno is a really dynamic city, and we're changing incredibly fast. But arts and culture and all the things that make cities great, and especially with infrastructure, our parks are incredibly important. Our open spaces, pl places where people also want to be out side and feel engaged and so we need to think sort of outside of this box and one of the things is you know cycling and transit and we're getting ready to do this big scooter initiative and a cycle track you know you see that very popular in european cities mm -hmm. so things that really can bring a community together but also innovative and i think that's what cities are really looking at what is the future for this next generation Right, Mayor Barnett, I mean, you and I have chatted before, and I guess it was with you, and we were like at a lunch or something with a you know, big gaggle of mayors. And I used to think that mayors you know, became uh, uh, popular if they filled potholes and got the trash collected on time. But I realized in kind of the show and tell that you had when you were president of, of the uh, US Conference of Mayors, you know, it was so many other dimensions about how you weigh in on inclusion, you know, how we're, you know, beginning to rate some cities, you know, like we rate buildings on, you know, uh, sustainability and best practices and whatnot. And, and, and I know that you've left your job as, as, as president of this and Francis Suarez of Miami is coming in. So you'll have to tell me what he's getting wrong already. But, but you know, you've got to tell me like how, you know, how, you know, in this world, you know, becoming a mayor is no longer just about potholes and about trash collection. Tell us what is on the screen of Rochester Hills, which I should tell the audience is one of the safest, judged to be one of the safest places in America. So that must have been one of your priorities. Well, it was and it is. If you don't you know, really have safety in a community, you don't have a, a whole lot else you can fall back on. It's a privilege to be with you and Mayor Shivia. Of course, I was just getting ready to think about buying a second home in Reno after that last uh, that last answer. She's a great leader Yay. for the organization. <laughs> uh, you know, it, so so there's something really interesting, and it's 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 always very fun to be in Washington D.C. because I think our organization stands in such stark contrast to what we see and hear uh, every day in this town in particular. We just had a press conference. Uh, uh, an hour or so ago where Republicans and Democrats and independents stood shoulder to shoulder next to each other, patting each other on the back, smiling, encouraging with each other, not always agreeing 100 percent on everything, but understanding that there's probably 85 percent of the stuff that we do agree on and really focusing on that. You asked what it's like to be a mayor. There's one thing that's really unique about being a mayor that I think is interesting, and that is that in study after study, we have uh, have earned the most trust from those we serve. People trust local levels of government more so than state and federal levels. Now, why in this whole history of that? I, I don't pretend to understand or know all of that, but I do know that in my community, people trust me. So what that does to me is tell me I've got a certain level of accountability that I better deliver on, uh, whether it be transparent ways I run the city and, and what we're actually working on in terms of creating a city for everyone. And so uh, with that level of trust, with that level of accountability, uh, comes a tremendous responsibility for mayors to deliver results. And that's, I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, stands in stark contrast to the sort of pontificating that you often see uh, in polarized politics in cities like Washington, D.C. today. I love being a mayor because I love working and learning from other mayors. Well, let me ask you to just double down on that for a minute. You, you really, you know, when we spoke before, but I also know that you are on a panel with this conference um, this year on uh, disability inclusion. And, you know, when we've talked about where you're, you're kind of for inclusion of all kinds. And this is the really interesting question, because we talk a lot about inclusion. We talk a lot about divides, racial, income, opportunity. Um, and, and I guess the really interesting thing is, I am wondering, what is the secret to getting people who feel um, unwilling, unless you've done what you're doing, to basically be inclusive? How do you get gravity to work in a, in a way that brings people together so that as a city manager planner, you're creating and building in inclusion uh, in a way that, that parts of your city can't reject. Sure. Is that fair? It's a great question. There, there's not a super simple answer, except that mayors have to lead by example, right? And and coming from where I come from in the Motor City, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that we talk about, we talk about the future of cities, and as it relates to your question about disability, um, you know, the, the future of transportation is huge. Electrification is huge. 
autonomous vehicles are tremendously important. Think about, you know, we often talk about the last mile in public transportation. Think about the last decade. Most people have their keys taken away from them before they're really probably done you know, with, with, with driving. Think about uh, if you're able to offer uh, mobility to the disabled community, uh, the opportunities that you'd give them both in, in work and, and, and life. And so, um, you know, you think about those and think, okay, well, I don't maybe know anybody disabled. I don't have that personal experience. But man, I, I do understand how transportation works, how the freedoms it creates in my life. And I can see a path and what, how what I'm doing impacts and affects others. And, you know, that's just one small example of, uh, of, of ways that, um, you know, I think that we all are sort of interconnected. It does start by mayors leading by example. And if you're not, if you don't recognize now that making sure your community is an open and accepting place and that you're constantly working to include everyone, uh, you're going to be passed. Uh, there's just no way around that. It is, you know, my community is, is more diverse in every census, considerably more diverse in every census. And if I'm not paying attention to that, uh, shame on me. All right, that's great uh, and very powerful. I want to ask um, Mayor Shivi a question from the audience, but I want to tell our audience that she was made in 2017 chair of the Conference of Mayors Committee for Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports. So you know that TV show, Parks and Recreation, that's kind of the hot plum committee as far as I'm concerned. It's probably got big, big rankings. But Jim Whitehead, who is the CEO of the International Society for Sports Psychiatry, says each city will have its own strategies and challenges. But what are the coordinated efforts that all cities should be part of? So it's a really interesting question. You're at a, you know, an assembly of mayors, you're working with them in this. And I, and, I, and I do think that sometimes people forget how powerful culture, arts, recreation, parks can be as defining edges and, and also drivers of growth and experience. But I, I what he's asking is some of that can be boutique and some of that can be coordinated. And I'm interested in how within the conference you approach that with some of your colleagues. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. And Mayor Barnett knows um, I'm a big proponent of arts and culture. And one of the things that we have here right in my backyard is Burning Man. I don't know oh. if you've ever been to Burning Man, but it is an incredible experience. And not Grover to mention Northwood keeps wanting to take me. I, I'm probably going to get in trouble for that, but <laughs> Grover's trying to drag me out there. Right, right. I know. I've got pictures of, of Mayor Barnett. So when he yes. runs again, he might I've, have a I've, I've been and I've been reelected <laughs> since. So you can get reelected and go to Burning Man. It's, Mayor Burnett, happen. were you clothed? <laughs> I, I, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. <laughs> but it's Burning Man is absolutely phenomenal. And I have to tell you, you know, when we talk about infrastructure, it's really amazing about that pop up city. It's the largest pop up city in the world during that week. And so we learn when mayors go out there a lot about infrastructure as well and sort of. Um, the practices that they use out there, which are, you know, really fascinating, like MOOP, for instance, and that's, you know, you're not supposed to leave any material objects behind. So there's like this big sustainability component to Burning Man as well. But obviously the arts and culture out there are something like probably no one has ever seen before. And it was interesting to take mayors out there and mayors that were reluctant to go. And actually once we got out there, you know, they got very comfortable and realized, you know, it was a very free environment, but also looking at art, um, how they can infuse it in their own cities and seeing this massive attraction of 70,000 people that are coming together, you know, for, for this big event. Um, there's so many different layers to it, but it really sort of, for me, epitomizes, you know, the definition of arts and culture in someone's city and how to leverage that. It's economically, for me, it's the busiest time at my airport. All my small businesses thrive when Burning Man is in town. There's a massive economic mm -hmm. impact when it comes to arts and culture, and that definitely can't be overlooked. And so um, I'm very fortunate to have it right in my backyard and be able to take mayors out there, you know, for part of the day and part of the night so that they can experience what that's like and out there you know we talk about you know this sort of nonpartisan, and that's what what I love about the arts it is nonpartisan, and it makes us all come together and you know we try to infuse arts in every single um, development project that we have I, I think arts are the way that you package a city and the first time you you know step off a plane into into a new city you mm. look at it and you say wow I can see this great arts art sculpture what else is there 
you know, hiding in the city that really kind of brings to life arts and culture. So it's it's very, very important. And I think, you know, mayors really, really embrace cultures of their community. And it gets us, you know, you're talking about how do you create those, um, you know, how do you remove those barriers? And I think it's really, truly through arts and culture. Well, thank you. I mean, and, and Mayor Barnard, I'd love you to build on the same question because the question is interesting because, I mean, like every, every city, you know, will have its own assets. But, but what I love about the conference of, you know, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and, and, and particularly when you were there, is that they're great shows and tells of innovation, and sometimes you go in and learn something that, you know, somebody was doing in one place, and there are a lot of really key questions, you know, about our society right now. And as I mentioned, you know, lead certification communities are developing that are not just buildings, but they, they're, they're driven by parks, you know, quality of life, you know, intergenerational inclusion, racial inclusion, all of these other dimensions. And, and I know in Rochester Hills, you know, you have been working real hard on kind of, you know, opening new green spaces and trails, bringing this in. And, and I'm just wondering how hot the competition is to turn your towns and cities into cool places. Because in a COVID world where we're all online and not necessarily forced to be in office, creating that quality of life has become important, not just in the Bay Area and San Francisco, but everywhere, right? I mean, so how are you competing in this new environment in a, in a post-COVID, we're not post-COVID yet, folks, but we will be post-COVID, but I have a feeling we're all gonna be less, less attached to a single ge geographic spot. So what do you think, Mayor Barnett? Well, you're, you're spot on. It's almost as if you were listening to one of our earlier meetings this morning when, you know, the, the pandemic has pulled back the covers on a lot of uh, a lot of things. There's been some some interesting you know, benefits that we've we've realized communities have come together and, and nonprofits have stepped up and we've learned a lot about ourselves. But there's been some challenges that I think are going to be systemic. And one of those is is the fact, as you just mentioned, people are realizing with the rise of telework, um, you don't have to necessarily work close or live close to where you work. Uh, you can choose to live where you want to live. Mm. And, and that makes placemaking for a mayor and a community really important. The parks, the, 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 the amenities that you have, the library, the, 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 the soft services that you provide become really important because no longer does it matter if you're only going into the office maybe once a month or, or at all. And so uh, it's creating challenges because uh, in states like Ohio, uh, where, where they you know, are funded in large measure by, uh, and I love making fun of Ohio as a guy from Michigan, but in states where they, they you know, are funded largely by income tax, income tax paid by where you work, not where you live, uh, and the, you know, less and less people being in these downtown urban areas, that's creating a real challenge. In suburban communities like mine, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something we have to be very mindful of. We are going to be competing against a much larger geographic area because people no longer have to necessarily live close to where they work. Uh, in a community like mine, I think that sets us up nicely because we have invested, even through the pandemic, incredibly uh, uh, aggressively in parks and recreation. That's that's always mm -hmm. been an important tenet of who we've been. So uh, communities that recognize that, I think, will be well positioned. And there'll be some real challenges for, for urban communities as we sort of figure out the future of retail uh, and the future of, of work. Well, it's fascinating. It's a wonderful discussion, again, Mayor Barnett, with you. And Mayor Shivi, it's great to meet you. Uh, I want to thank Hillary Shivi, Mayor of Reno, Nevada, and I think she's probably Honorary Mayor of uh, Burning Man, if I may say so. And Brian Barnett, <laughs> Mayor of Rochester Hills, Michigan, immediate past president of the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Really appreciate both of you taking time with us today. Happy to be here. Thank you.